What are we here for? To be good. Were you being good? If we're good today, we'll be better tomorrow. And if we're better tomorrow... Dr. Cotton is happy. Dr. Cotton is happy. And when Dr. Cotton is happy, I'm happy. Are you busy? What's wrong? Charlotte, I don't have time. Read this. It explains everything. Super good. Protect your fur. Hmm? How about Charlotte? No, 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 no. Ah! No, 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 no. Don't take my tea. No, Martin loves my smile. No. Watch it, watch it, watch it. No, 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 no. no. Imagine suffering a mental break of some sort, visiting a psychiatrist to have yourself examined. Then your prescription is the removal of 27 of your teeth, and you'll be just fine. It sounds the same, right? But if you've been a patient of Dr. Henry Aloysius Cotton from 1917 to 1930, the idea of this scenario would not have been far-fetched. As a matter of fact, his mental patients who only had their teeth removed were the lucky ones, because he preached that the cause of mental illness was infection in the body, and whatever was infected didn't need to be treated, but removed. So, if the source of your insanity was beyond your teeth, he might need to remove your tonsils, or your stomach, or your gallbladder, or your colon, or ladies, your ovaries, or gentlemen, your testicles. These are all methods that Dr. Henry Cotton used to treat and cure mental illness, and his methods were actually praised by people in and out of the medical profession. People were mesmerized by him and believed whatever he said, and he loved every minute of it. It's probably not hard to imagine that Dr. Cotton became drunk with power and high on his own hype. Think about it. How many times have you or I gone to a doctor's office because we were sick, only to have him or her tell us exactly what's wrong, then hand us a prescription written in some chicken scratch handwriting that we can't even read. Then we take it to our pharmacist, hand over the sheet with the squiggly writing, asking our pharmacist, please give me whatever is written on here, because we know that whatever that is, it's going to fix us. We often blindly trust the guy in the white coat with the stethoscope around his neck because he knows better than we do. He, or she, studied medicine for several years. We didn't. The faith that we put in our doctors can create an atmosphere that can be a breeding ground for medical arrogance. Knowing what we know now about medicine and mental health, it won't surprise you to learn that Dr. Cotton often cured his patients to death. The medical records that he kept on his patients were falsified, sloppy, and incomplete. Thankfully for us, New Jersey news writers covered a number of stories about him, and a few medical professionals and relatives of his patients voiced their concerns about Dr. Cotton's practices. They give us a more complete and accurate picture of his legacy. So I'm going to take you on a journey to view some of his publicized cases and where I can. I'm going to let you hear his own words. They are absolutely terrifying, especially when you take into consideration that he was performing life-threatening surgery on people and lying to everyone about his success rates. I think that before this story is over, we will all be wondering how this guy was ever allowed to practice medicine. Behind the closed doors of the facilities he ran, he was a butcher, not a doctor. Yet, he was recognized as a pioneer in mental health in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Europe. He was famous. He was untouchable. This is the story of how one man's professional arrogance went horribly awry and left hundreds of patients dead. The ones who survived Cotton's surgeries wished they had not. Dr. Henry Cotton was more than a hot mess. He was a medical monster and frankly, a menacing murderer. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Miss History a time capsule for the culture, hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload content. And whether you're watching or listening, thank you for letting me be a part of your day. How a thing starts is not always how a thing ends. 
That statement applies to the medical career of Dr. Henry Cotton. He was born in Norfolk, Virginia on May 18, 1876. His grade school days were spent in the public schools of Baltimore, Maryland. He remained in that city for his academic career, studying at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. His reputation was as prestigious then in 1900 as it is today. So, Cotton's credentials were impeccable, and his original intentions for going into his field were everything that you would want for your own doctor's intentions to be. He wanted to make his patients feel comfortable. He wanted to raise the standards of psychiatry and have it recognized as a totally respectable field of medicine. You see, in the time that Henry was studying to become a doctor, people who had mental problems were institutionalized in state mental hospitals that were often referred to as insane asylums. These places were grossly overcrowded, understaffed, and underfunded. A perfect storm that created appalling and unsanitary living conditions for patients who were subjected to neglect and even violence at the hands of staff members. Common treatment practices for patients included restraining them in straight jackets and chains, giving them ice baths and electroshock therapy. These institutions were houses of horror. But Henry wanted to change all of that. When he took up his post as medical director and superintendent at Trenton State Hospital in New Jersey in 1907, he set out to make those changes. He was determined to reform the deplorable condition of affairs that he found there. And that's what he started out doing. He put an end to the practice of restraining patients. He started training programs for the nurses so that they could learn how to start handling the patients without violence. He even made efforts to hire more female nurses because he felt that they were naturally more gentle and the patients were more at ease with them than the male nurses. But he didn't simply replace the men with women. He added more staff to the facility in an effort to make it a safer environment for everyone there. He even had fire alarms installed. And that's saying a lot about his desire to upgrade the hospital because building safety codes were practically non-existent in those times. His hope was to turn the old asylum into a new hospital. And he meant business. He wasn't just thinking about these reforms or telling his wife about what he wanted to do when he went home. Henry spoke to state politicians and persuaded them to fund all of the upgrades. And they did. Not because they had a deep passion for mental health, but for the main reason that a politician does anything. Money. Henry's arguments for the reforms at Trenton State Hospital were so persuasive because he told the politicians that in the long run, the state of New Jersey would be relieved of the economic burden of caring for those patients. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where the trouble began. The state gave Dr. Cotton everything he asked for. Now it was his turn to start curing those mental patients and start getting them off of the state's financial books. He had to show and prove. And that's what caused this good doctor to turn bad. And this is how he did it. With a treatment plan that he learned from his studies. A plan that he was convinced could not fail. As a matter of fact, it was the only thing that made sense. So, Henry was serious about his studies when he was in medical school. He became the protege of Adolf Meyer, who was the most prominent psychiatrist in the United States at the turn of the century. And Meyer was a proponent of using scientific research to discover the biological causes of mental disorders. Henry further explored this theory, that mental illness was rooted in biological causes, under other doctors in Europe who believed the same thing. But nobody seemed to believe it as fervently as Henry. He developed his own theory about the cause of all mental illness, and it was an interesting one, and it was this. Insanity was caused by untreated infections in the body. And you know what carries infection? Teeth. Therefore, by removing the infected teeth of his mental patients, he would cure their insanity. He had been at his post at Trenton State for almost a decade before he finally had this figured out. The state politicians who had supported his reforms were still waiting to see some results. So, Dr. Henry Cotton started delivering. By 1917, he became a tooth-pulling machine and was curing mental patients left and right. 
Sure, they didn't smile with as much confidence as they had before entering his facility, but when they got released, psychosis, gone. And those were his luckiest patients, because sometimes he would pull their teeth and (laughs) they were still a little crazy. Well, you know what that means. There was still some more infection in there, so it was time for some more surgery. In those cases, he would operate on the tonsils next. Take out those bad boys. If the patient still wasn't cured, Dr. Cotton would have to keep working at finding the root of the mental illness. Next, he would remove the sinuses. If removing those didn't work, he would go on to the next logical step. Removing the spleen, of course. If that didn't work, he'd have to remove a part of the stomach, obviously. If that didn't work, ladies... It was probably because you had one of those crazy lady diseases. You know, those female problems that people would talk about but wouldn't really talk about. So yeah, goodbye to those ovaries. And fellas, don't feel left out. Because if you were still crazy after having most of your colon removed, then clearly your insanity was caused by your defective male chromosomes. So, off with your testicles. They don't call them nuts for no reason. As psychotic as these courses of treatment sound to us today, they really are the practices that were used by Dr. Cotton. His reign of terror lasted for more than a decade. He performed over 600 surgeries, removing people's organs. He pulled out over 11,000 teeth, including some of his own, his wife's, and his children. We'll get to that tragedy a little later. Henry routinely killed patients during surgery. And because he believed in himself so much, there are a number of times that, after performing his surgeries, he sent patients home, marking them off on his records as sane, only to have those patients return to their families and die as a result of their surgery. Or worse, return to their families and commit heinous crimes against their own relatives because they were still insane and removing their teeth didn't fix them. And many of his cases were covered by the same newspapers that helped to make him a literal celebrity of his day. Here are some that stood out to me. So in addition to recording the insane as sane, Dr. Cotton also did the reverse and recorded the people who were sane as insane. His mentally sound patients who were lucky enough to escape from the Trenton State Hospital would often turn up years after fleeing, living normal, happy lives. That was the case with Richard von Krebs in 1910. He was an inmate, as they were called, at the New Jersey hospital under Dr. Cotton's care, and in October of 1909, he broke out and went on the run. Instead of returning home to Middlesex County, New Jersey, as everyone thought he would, he ran to New York, and there... He was able to find employment for a prominent family as their butler. And that was pretty much the best job that a man who worked in service could get. And butlers were paid well in those days. The bottom line was that Richard had his life together. The only reason that he became a topic for the news in 1910 was that a man had been arrested in Providence, Rhode Island, on the charge of double murder. And he told the police that his name was Krebs. That made Cotton think that it was Von Krebs, his escapee. But it wasn't him. Von Krebs was living a successful life in New York and had also been declared mentally stable by a New York physician. Before we move on to the next story, I have to say that I don't know how or why Richard Von Krebs ended up in the asylum in the first place. But it was all too common in those days for people to put family members in insane asylums as forms of punishment and revenge. We'll never know how many people ended up in those places who never belonged there at all. Something like that could have been the case with Von Krebs. Could have been. I don't know for sure. But it does seem that more often, the people who were admitted to these places against their will were women. If their husbands thought that they weren't acting right, they could get sent away to the crazy house for some correcting. You know, woman... You can come home after you're ready to make my dinner the right way. Right, fellas? Crazy women. Anyway, 
The stuff with Von Krebs was small potatoes compared to the incidents that came later in his career. A few more of his patients escaped and were found living normal lives as sane people. At some point in 1913, Dr. Cotton gave a speech on mental hygiene and prostitution. I'd love to see the notes on that one. Then in 1914, a boy died after Henry operated on him. The main factor in the boy's death was that Henry didn't follow proper protocol during the surgery and made no effort to provide a clean and sanitized operating room. Henry didn't wear gloves during the surgery. And even though the boy died, the focus of the short story was Henry's arm. It was poisoned during the surgery, but thankfully he would recover. The doctor's arm would be saved. But it was this headline that was printed on October 22, 1918 in the Asbury Park Press that made Henry Cotton famous. Infected teeth, tonsils given as insanity causes. In the article, we learned that Dr. Cotton had been experimenting with his cure for the past 11 years. That's right, 11 years of careful scientific experimentation brought him to the conclusion that was going to sweep the practice of psychiatry right off its feet. The claims were bold. Dr. Cotton declared that removing infected teeth was a permanent cure for insanity. If needed, removal of tonsils and clearing up the gastrointestinal tract would only improve results. Here are Cotton's own words about his breakthrough cure for the insane. Quote, we are able to cure early cases in a very short time, prevent disease from becoming chronic in a large number of cases, and restore a certain number who have been in the hospital for as long as nine years. We have found that infection of the chronic type and the resulting toxemia are the basis of many mental disturbances. These chronic infections are known as focal infection and may be present for years without their existence becoming known to the patient. And until quite recently, the physicians and the dentists have been ignorant of their existence. We are pleased to report that the study of the cause of a large majority of mental diseases, from the standpoint of the clinical laboratory, has at last proved successful. For the last three years, we have been convinced that the etiology and treatment of these psychoses would be solved by the laboratory, and we are now in position to confirm our theories regarding this subject. At first, the teeth and tonsils were thoroughly investigated. In many cases, the infected teeth were extracted, producing gratifying results in some cases, but in the majority, no improvement was noted. Some of these cases had their infected tonsils removed. And again, we noted a marked improvement and even recovery in one half of these cases. The next point of attack was the gastrointestinal infection. End quote. It goes on, but I'm pretty sure that we get the point. We know that none of the tooth extractions or surgeries were a cure for mental illness, but in 1918, people didn't know that. Henry Cotton was the doctor, the man who was a top student at one of the top medical schools in the country. He had been experimenting for over a decade, and he had a successful track record of curing patients. He was young and energetic and making the hospital better. So, of course, everyone around him was thinking, we should trust this guy. Meanwhile, Sigmund Freud and his followers were preaching that mental illness was rooted in the pathologies of the psyche and childhood trauma. And, of course, Dr. Cotton dismissed Freud's notions as quackery. You know, that's just plain stupid. So what are you saying? You don't even give your patients a dental exam? So, these findings from his 11-year experiment that today we all know are completely incorrect, become the cornerstone for Dr. Henry Cotton's celebrated career. You can imagine that things got scary from this point. Now the state government is backing him. He's delivering big time on his promises to the state of New Jersey. So the politicians are singing his praises and he is loving every minute of it. So he has to keep going, keep extracting teeth, Keep removing body parts. Keep saying that patients are cured and sane. Every Dr. Cotton stamp of sanity equals more money in the coffers for the state of New Jersey. Cotton was making the profession look good to the outside world. 
to people outside of the doors of his hospital of horror, he was a doctor who could do no wrong. But his patients were afraid of him. They did not want him to perform those surgeries. Well, guess what? Consent didn't matter in Dr. Cotton's facilities. His patients were dragged, kicking and screaming into his operating room. It would be another seven years before anyone heard their cries and took their complaints seriously. But by then, hundreds would be dead. But we'll get there. The year following Cotton's amazing medical findings in June of 1919, a report of the State Affairs of New Jersey was published, and it covered multiple topics, including the miraculous turnaround at Trenton Hospital. The subheading says 40% cured, which would have been phenomenal, but that doesn't tell the whole story of Dr. Cotton's wonders. In part, stated about the mental health boy wonder, quote, The reports made by Dr. Cotton, the commissioner said, show that the Trenton Hospital is releasing as recovered more than 40% of the number received, whereas Morris Plains Hospital now reports that it releases but 16% of the total number received. End quote. Morris Plains Hospital was another hospital in New Jersey that treated mentally ill patients. And we can imagine that the staff at that facility wasn't feeling too great after seeing how Dr. Cotton was leading his staff to outperform them. The report went on to make some more comparisons that demonstrated that nobody was better at mental health than Dr. Cotton. Now, before you hear the rest of Henry's numbers, I want you to keep in mind that the 16% figure recorded for Morris Plains was right in line with the national average for curing mental patients. 12 to 18% seemed to be what everyone else was recording. But check out how Henry Cotton's cure stats compare to all civil state hospitals in New York. For manic depressive cases, Henry, 76.6%. New York, 49.2%. Boo. For alcoholic cases, Henry, 87.2%. New York, 39.3%. Boo. For dementia precox cases, 71.8% for Dr. Henry. New York, only 1.1%. Boo. Henry Cotton was the Babe Ruth, the Michael Jordan, the Wayne Gretzky, the Muhammad Ali of mental wellness. He was the greatest of all time. And you heard it, he cured tons of alcoholics too. 12 Steps Therapy, detox, none of my watch. Hand me my forceps and I'll knock that alcoholism right on out of you. He was curing the lunatics left and right. Trenton State Hospital had become the mental health version of fast food service. He was getting them in and getting them out of there. Uh, Dr. Cotton, we have a new psychosis patient for you. Here's her chart. What? Chart? Get that chart out of here. I know what the problem is. Nurse, hand me my forceps. We've got to get rid of 12 of these chompers and she'll be all good. It sounds crazy, but that's really how much Cotton believed in himself. He was so full of himself that the following year, in January of 1920, he stepped outside of his field and into the practice of dentistry to make suggestions to those doctors. His plea to them was that they stop saving teeth that are bad. Yank them out instead. He was telling dentists how to do their jobs, to discard their years of study in dental health for the sake of mental health. In the Asbury Park Press article called Urges Dentistry as Aid to Health, Dr. Cotton declares infected teeth contribute much to insanity, it was further explained. Quote, The education, as proposed by Dr. Cotton, should be along the lines of endeavoring to have dentists extract infected teeth rather than through mechanical dentistry seek to save them. To the extraction of infected teeth, as well as to operations on the tonsils and other organs of the body, Dr. Cotton has attributed his success in being able to discharge 274 patients of the 410 cases that had been admitted to the institution. End quote. If you didn't think that you were insane or 
didn't have your family members and friends suggesting that you were. Would you take a chance on visiting a dentist who would not make an effort to save your teeth, but pull them out instead? I know that I would not. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments section. After making this suggestion to dentists, Henry's fame only grew. He was literally famous. His name became a staple in the New Jersey Society pages. If you've watched my Titanic passenger scandals or my profiles on other super wealthy socialites, you've seen me talk about how in the late 1800s, early 1900s, people were famous just for being wealthy. So papers would print stories about when those people went to parties and went on vacations, things like that. Well, in the 1910s and 1920s, they were writing about Dr. Cotton in the very same way. They would track his every move. Dr. Cotton is going to Europe to speak at a conference. His family is going to such and such place for vacation. He was like Elvis, except he was killing people. Just months after his message to dentists, the Coast Star published a short article called Recovery Rate High at State Hospital, wherein once again, his 40% recovery rate was compared to the average of the other state hospitals, which was only 15%. But readers also learned that Henry went to New York City to preach the gospel of his tooth extractions. He gave a speech on the relation of focal infection to mental disease at the Waldorf Astoria. That was his life now. He was often invited to speak in the conference rooms of exclusive hotels and the lecture halls of prestigious universities, inside and outside of the United States, because the entire medical world was in awe of his recovery rate. They wanted to know his methods so that they could produce those kinds of results at their facilities. So, they started to practice his methods. Several institutions in the United States, the UK, Canada, and Europe were pulling teeth of mental patients and removing the organs of mental patients. But those institutions just couldn't replicate Henry's results. Mm. Thankfully, a lot of dentists did not listen to Henry's advice and they went on doing their jobs, continuing to treat and save teeth. They left the extractions to the psychiatrist. How crazy does that sound? Well, Dr. Cotton didn't like that the dentists weren't making the proper contributions to mental sanity. So he got back on his soapbox later that year in August, but this time he spoke a little more harshly about those anti-mental health dentists. His opinions were expressed in an Asbury Park Press article called Modern Dentistry, Menace to Health, Dr. Cotton averse. Cotton struck down any type of aesthetic dentistry, flat out calling gold crowns and bridge work criminal. Once again, he stated that all infected teeth should be extracted. And he was so sure that this was the right thing to do because of his recovery rate. Remember that it was 40%? Well, now, in August of 1920, it had climbed up to 44%. I'm sure that as this story progresses, you will notice the rise in his recovery rate. So it only makes sense that Henry, quote, cut the population of the institution down, saving the state a tidy sum of money, end quote. There you see it. He was saving the state money. Why would anyone want to stop him? And he spoke like a man who couldn't be stopped. Here are some of his own words from this article. Quote, The most worthy investigators in the field of dentistry have for years called attention to the criminal practice of saving teeth, which should be extracted, by such methods as pivot teeth, gold crowns, and fixed bridge work. We believe that full publicity should be given to this danger that the public should be warned and instructed in the field of dentistry, that they should demand the proper kinds of dental work and not accept the sort that will later cause either physical or mental trouble. End quote. I'm sure the dentists loved this guy. I can hear him now talking to a dentist and just not understanding. So your patient has a tube abscess and you're going to do what? Drain it? Fix it? 
That's weird. I guess that's one way to handle it. I don't know how that's going to fix his dementia, but okay. I guess you can only do what they taught you in dental school. Anyway, he went on to say, quote, We do not stand alone in our opinion regarding the danger of infected teeth, but have the support of the most progressive medical men and also the leading dental authorities. We find that the infected tooth is a prominent factor in all of our cases, but we would fail utterly if our work was confined to the extraction of infected teeth. We feel that this is usually the source of infection which pervades other organs of the body. Unfortunately, the impression has gotten abroad that we claim infected teeth to be the sole cause of insanity. We have been dubbed by one Philadelphia neurologist as a mecca of exodontia. We submit that in all of our writings, we have always stated that the infection of teeth, tonsils, and gastrointestinal tract and other food of infection are responsible for the trouble. End quote. You can hear the arrogance in his words. He clearly knew that he had some critics who thought that his methods were quackery. But he dismisses those guys because he had the support of the most progressive medical men and leading dental authorities. So the professionals who disagreed with him just hadn't caught up with the times or they were just a bunch of stupids. I have to say that it's comforting looking back at these news stories knowing that everyone wasn't blindly following Dr. Cotton. Very good on that Philadelphia neurologist who called Cotton's insane asylum a mecca of exodontia, you know, the branch of dentistry that deals with extraction of teeth. In addition to not being easily persuaded, it seems like that neurologist also had a good sense of humor. But what was not a laughing matter was Henry Cotton's insistence that his barbaric surgeries were working to cure his patients. You've heard the other things that he was removing from bodies besides teeth. He went on to say, It would be foolish to state that by eliminating infected teeth and tonsils alone, we have obtained results in our patients. When these sources of infection are found, they must be eliminated. But if the patient does not recover, our work does not stop here. End quote. And you know what that means. He would continue to chop up the insides of his patients until they were cured. Well, let me tell you. Dr. Cotton was on a roll in 1920, because just a few months after he had sent out his warning about the dangers of uh, restorative dental work, it turns out that Henry had his most successful month to date. Yep. Henry and his forceps of sanity had sent home as sane the largest number of mental patients that Trenton State Hospital ever had. This guy was like the Sam's Club or the Costco of mental health. He didn't cure one patient at a time. He cured in bulk. The state and the press were singing his praises in a 1920 November article called Many Cures in State Hospital. Commissioner Lewis's report reveals many cures of supposed chronic cases of lunacy. So how many do you think he sent home in October of 1920? 10? 20? 30? Try 62. That's right. And it was all thanks to his miracle method. Three cases in particular were really impressive. Two women and one man. One was that of a woman who Cotton had released the year before, in 1919, but she was readmitted in October of 1920 because she had developed hallucinations. And, quote, a much more extensive examination of the teeth showed that 27 were infected. These were removed, and the patient's condition cleared up so that she is now considered normal. End quote. So, back home she went. Then, quote, another case was that of a woman who had been discharged in July 1919 after having spent three years in the hospital. Until recently, she was regarded as having fully recovered, but she suffered a breakdown, and it was found that her teeth had been neglected. After the removal of the infected teeth, her mental condition cleared up. End quote. Her teeth had been neglected. Wouldn't you know it? Then there was the man. He was a soldier who also suffered from hallucinations. He'd already been in a number of government hospitals, but they just couldn't get his mind right. Well, let me tell you. 
They got that man over to Dr. Cotton on July 17th. Three days later, Cotton took his tonsils out. And by July the 24th, he was good to go home. But after the soldier got home, he was still having mental problems. And, quote, when he suffered a relapse, further examination disclosed seven suspicious teeth. These were removed and the patient's condition again cleared up. End quote. The praise for Henry Cotton's work was summed up in these words. Such recoveries as are already recorded in the reports of Dr. Cotton are truly remarkable and most unusual. End quote. Yeah, most unusual is right. There was no stopping Henry, but maybe there should have been. And I mean that someone should have stopped Henry Cotton because it started to become pretty obvious that his recovery rates were grossly miscalculated and exaggerated. Henry would continue to make claims about the astonishing number of patients he was curing. Then his patients started making some claims of their own. And what they were saying wasn't good for Henry Cotton or his medical reputation. In November of 1921, a woman accused Dr. Cotton and a doctor under his supervision, Robert G. Stone, of operating on her without her consent. Her name was Georgiana Phillips. Because it was 1921, the papers didn't just come out and say exactly what the operation was. In those times, things that only women went through, like menstrual cycles, pregnancy, childbirth, and menopause, were discussed in such a subtle manner that if a person didn't explicitly know for themselves what was being discussed, they might not have been able to figure it out. So, when the papers wrote about Georgiana Phillips, the stories would say that she had a delicate operation. Some papers did go as far as saying that she would not be able to have children. To put it plainly for us, the doctors removed her ovaries. The operation was not necessary to save her life, or benefit her health in any way, and she had witnesses who were willing to testify that it happened as she said it did. Georgiana had secured a writ which proved her sanity, so, unsurprisingly, she wanted to be released from the state institution. But after she submitted her request to be released, she was forced into the operating room for this procedure. At this point, it starts to look like Henry Cotton is performing these surgeries just for fun. In the midst of the investigation of Georgiana's claims, Dr. Cotton was honored at a convention when he was elected as the vice president of the American Academy of Applied Dental Science in January of 1922. The following month, the state dismissed the charges against Dr. Cotton. The vice chancellor over the case came to the conclusion that at least partial consent had been given. I don't know how in the hell that works. Vice Chancellor Buchanan went on to absolve Henry Cotton of wrongdoing by saying, quote, If a contempt was committed by him, it was by reason of either mistake or forgetfulness. End quote. The doctor simply forgot that Georgiana wanted to keep her ovaries and just go home. The state of New Jersey had created a monster. Not only was he reckless, he still appeared to be untouchable. Henry Cotton capped off the year of 1922 by fear-mongering. Remember that by this time, he was the vice president of the American Academy of Applied Dental Science. So now, he had every right to address doctors in the field of dentistry. On this occasion, he was addressing the Monmouth County Dental Society. This time, he pressed on them even harder to extract unhealthy teeth instead of saving them, telling each dentist that it was his duty to yank out those teeth. How could they trust what he was saying? Well, because he told them that the majority of his patients at the Hospital for the Insane had bad teeth. And out of the ones who did, 80% of those patients had expensive dental work. So, there you go. Cause and effect. Of course, that's in Henry's mind. Henry also told those dentists that if they didn't do the right thing and start extracting teeth, that Americans were going to have to take it upon themselves to find better dentists. Dentists who would stop making smiles look better 
and instead cure the mental insanity of their dental patients. And just in case you think that that story of Georgiana Phillips, the woman who lost her ovaries, was some kind of out of the ordinary situation for Dr. Cotton, here is a line that he threw in his speech addressing dentists. Quote, about 80% of the women have gynecological disturbances, which can be removed by surgical procedures. End quote. He was speaking of his own patients. We know the man didn't miss an opportunity to surgically remove mental illness, so I think that it's safe to say that around this time frame in his career, roughly 80% of his female patients were losing their ovaries to his cures. Somehow, his fame continued to grow. In January of 1923, Cotton accepted an invitation to speak at a medical conference in London. As the days went on, there seemed to be a pattern. Some kind of serious charge would be filed against Dr. Cotton. Then he'd receive another medical award. His recovery rates continued to climb. Then in 1925, One of Henry's patients, who he had released as sane, made the news for doing something that didn't seem sane at all. He released her on May 18th. That's his birthday, but anyway, he released her on May 18th. And guess what she did on May 26th? Just one week after Dr. Cotton said that she was sane, she killed her daughter. A 1925 Asbury Park Press article called Probe State Hospital Release of Slayer Woman at Tenet briefly told the story of Aretta Quackenbush. She was one of Dr. Cotton's success stories, a cured mental case, a toothless wonder. Well, after he had discharged her as sane, here's what happened. Quote, On the morning of May 26th, State police were called to the Quackenbush home, where they found Mrs. Quackenbush, a raving maniac, boasting that she had fixed her daughter. Troopers found the daughter hacked beyond recognition. The aged mother had used a hatchet, axe, hammer, and knife to kill her daughter. End quote. But how could this be? If anyone knew how to fix maniacs, it was Dr. Cotton. How do we know this? Because he said so. By this time, his recovery rate had jumped to an astonishing 87%. And Henry was right all the time. So this little homicide thingy with Mrs. Quackenbush, this didn't seem to have anything to do with him. He defended his decision to release her. It wasn't his fault. No, 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 no. According to Dr. Cotton, That girl wasn't murdered because he had released Aretta Quackenbush, a homicidal maniac. No, it was her sister's fault and her husband's fault, because when they picked her up from the hospital, they took her home, where she had a feeble-minded daughter. They should have known better. That's what he said. Now, I can't imagine where the good doctor would have thought her family was going to take her, except for home, Nevertheless, he stood his ground, saying that in all of his years in his post, none of his released patients had ever committed homicide. And that was true, but I don't know how that really makes a good defense, you know. None of my patients ever killed anyone before. Regardless, he was right. None of his patients had ever gone home and killed one of their family members. But... The Quackenbush case wouldn't be the last time that one of his quote-unquote sane patients committed homicide. However, Quackenbush slaying aside, there were a number of reasons that Henry's practices needed to be investigated, and that's just what was happening at the time that Aretta hacked her daughter to pieces. Here's what was happening. As Henry's recovery rates continued to soar, more and more doctors were pressured to implement the methods that Henry was using. Remember, he was saving the state of New Jersey a lot of money. So medical societies would pay Cotton to travel to various conventions and conferences so that he could share his knowledge, and those doctors could learn from him to do what he was doing. But 
When other doctors started extracting teeth and removing tonsils and removing other organs from their mental patients, they couldn't cure them. Finally, there came a point when enough psychiatrists were skeptical about Cotton's surgeries, and they spoke up. Their voices in unison led to the launch of an investigation that was led by a woman who was also taught by Adolf Meyer. She was Dr. Phyllis Greenacre. And very briefly, before we get into this story about this long overdue investigation into Dr. Cotton's practices, I want to share with you one story that illustrates pretty well, at least in my opinion, how much he was getting away with before anyone thought, hey, we might want to see exactly what Henry is doing over there at the mental clinic. The short story is titled, Son Dead, Three Weeks. Father Hears He's Ill. After you hear it, let me know if you can think of any reason why this story did it encourage the state to fire him or send him straight to prison. Quote, Charles Pierce, a resident of this place, is in receipt of a letter sent to him a few days ago by Dr. Henry Cotton, medical head of the New Jersey State Hospital at Trenton, in which Dr. Cotton notified him that his son, Howard, was seriously ill and had been confined to his bed. However, Howard Pierce's death had occurred at the hospital three or four weeks prior to the writing of the letter to his father, and the recipient was greatly puzzled over the letter. End quote. That's it? That's all. The dad was puzzled? No, the Board of Health is going to launch an investigation into Dr. Cotton. No, nothing. Just another day in the news. Dr. Cotton didn't tell this man that his son had been dead for three weeks. He wrote him a letter pretending that the boy was sick. Next up, 200 people enjoyed the entertainment at the annual smoker. That was literally the next story. I do not understand how there was no consequence to pay for a doctor who made up a lie about a dead patient still being alive. Henry wasn't caught off guard by this investigation that was coming up. Adolf Meyer let him know that Dr. Phyllis was coming, and it appears that because his former professor, who held him in such high regard, chose the person to lead the investigation, Henry felt at ease and really comfortable about it. So when Phyllis made her way to New Jersey to monitor his operations, Henry didn't change a thing that he was doing. He knew that his final report was going to come back squeaky clean. He even used the investigation on his practice to defend himself against releasing his mental daughter Slayer. As he told the press, quote, If you knew Dr. Meyer as I do, you would know the survey is unbiased. End quote. Because again, at the time that Aretta Quackenbush killed her daughter, the talk about the upcoming investigation was already out there in the atmosphere. Well, Dr. Meyer was Henry's patron and biggest supporter outside of the New Jersey politicians, so he wasn't unbiased, but Dr. Phyllis was. And by the time that she was done with her analysis, there would be enough evidence to prove that his mental institute was nothing more than a butcher shop. But would that be enough to shut him down? We'll see. First, let me tell you about another one of Henry's discharged, demented patients. Her name was Mrs. Alfred Miller. She was a 34-year-old woman who was a voluntary patient of his. She said that she suffered from dementia and depression. Well, Henry said that she didn't. After two months at his fine facility, she was ready to go, according to him. So he discharged her and sent her home, adding another patient to his success rate. And when Mrs. Miller got home, She attended her son's graduation that same evening. After that, she took her 14-month-old daughter with her to drown in a local canal. The state police used bloodhounds to find their bodies the next morning. I know that it sounds sad and it's awful that Dr. Cotton might have overlooked some insanity in a killer or two. But thankfully, he had a way to atone for it. If he had the power to declare an insane person as sane, then he had the power to do the reverse and declare that a sane person was insane. And he would exercise that power later in the year 
when Sampan Ajanian was snatched from the fate of the electric chair. Samped was a man who was sentenced to death for killing his aunt, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison. Well, he was only 32 and in relatively good health. That meant that the state would most likely have to pay for his existence until he died of natural causes. That could be a long time. Thankfully, that would not be the case after Dr. Cotton got a glimpse of him. Cotton said that Sam Pent was perfectly sane, so the state could go on and start warming up that electric chair. And they did. Sam Pedd fried in the electric chair. By the way, he killed his aunt because she rejected his romantic advances. So we can be pretty sure that he did not have any mental problems at all. Because it's perfectly normal to be in love with your aunt. Because Dr. Cotton said so. Then there was the case of Aura Lane, a woman who could have been facing death if she had been determined to be sane. She was on trial for killing her sister, Minna Roberts. Well, Dr. Cotton said that he assessed her and found her to be sane. I should mention that Aura Lane was a black woman, or as the press called her, a negress. And I'm bringing up her race because it matters in this story. As I am sure we all know, Race mattered much more in the 1920s than it does today. In those times, it was very common and sometimes even only legal for white patients to be treated by white doctors and black patients to be treated by black doctors. And Oralane was under the care of a black psychiatrist before she killed her sister. His name was Dr. James Parker. According to him, Aura suffered from delusional insanity. He didn't claim to know the exact cause, but he suspected that it was brought on by injuries she sustained in an accident four years before she killed her sister. Here's what happened on the night of the murder. Both ladies were visiting their brother at his home. Aura had a boyfriend who came to join them for dinner. When she introduced her boyfriend to Mena, Mena didn't want to shake his hand, and Aura fired a revolver from under her apron putting three bullets into her sister, ending her life. The witnesses, the family members and friends at the dinner party, never saw it coming. The jury got to hear from all of the witnesses, Dr. Parker and Dr. Cotton, as well as Dr. John C. Clayton. He was another white physician who attended to Aura while she was in prison. He agreed with her black doctor that Aura was insane. It took the jury 30 minutes to deliberate, they came back with a guilty verdict for first-degree murder and a recommendation of mercy. They did not believe Dr. Cotton's claim that she was sane. They also thought that Aura was insane. Judge Jacob Steinbach Jr. followed their recommendation, giving her a sentence of life imprisonment instead of the death penalty. Cotton's glory days were officially over. So what happened with Dr. Phyllis Greenacre's investigation? She observed and took notes as he carried on as usual, performing his bizarre surgeries. What she saw with her own eyes was nothing like what she had read about Cotton's wondrous works in the newspapers and medical journals. She exposed that his 87% success rate was a huge lie, and that, in fact, 33% of Cotton's patients died immediately after surgery. Perhaps his thought was, they are not insane if they are dead. But we already knew that there was no way that his recovery rate was real. Dr. Phyllis reported that the conditions in his hospital in general were not clean and safe. And it took her a while to figure out just what it was about Cotton's patients that made her uncomfortable. The problem was that most of them were missing their teeth. She knew that he was pulling teeth, but That just wasn't normal to see, and it freaked her out. But her feelings of unease weren't worthy of being the main subject of a report. She needed something substantial and concrete. And that's what she found in the medical records that Dr. Cotton and his staff were maintaining. The information and statistics in his records were contradictory. It seemed that at times, he really was marking dead patients as sane and cured in an effort to sort it all out, because it was truly a mess. 
Phyllis selected a test group of 62 of his patients to closely inspect their records. Now, according to Dr. Cotton, 53 of these 62 patients were cured, but Dr. Phyllis discovered that, in fact, 17 of those patients had died right after surgery, and 37 of them died only months after their surgeries. They were never included in the very low mortality rate that Cotton was reporting to the state and the press. Three of the patients showed signs of improvement, and five appeared to have recovered completely. This meant that his impressive recovery rate of 87% was slightly off. It was actually 8%. But you know what was 87% from this test group? The mortality rate. Practically every stat that Cotton had reported was a lie. The veil was off, and it looked like the biggest lunatic in the Trenton State Hospital was Dr. Henry Cotton himself. His patients who hadn't been killed in surgery were being mistreated and abused by Cotton and his staff. And this information was discovered by another source as well, a New Jersey State Senate committee named the Bright Simpson Committee. You see... By the mid to late 1920s, Henry Cotton was finally falling out of favor with the state. Complaints were pouring in from too many directions to ignore them all. The Bright Simpson Committee, which was also just called the Bright Committee, turned up one disturbing complaint after another. Employees who said it was terrible to work for Dr. Cotton, ex-patients who talked about their own mistreatment, and the abuse and deaths that they witnessed at the hands of Dr. Cotton. Family members of Cotton's patients who spoke of their loved one's maimed bodies and how quickly they died after coming home and being cured by Cotton's surgeries. The Bright Committee investigation could not have come at a better time for Dr. Phyllis. She knew what she was up against with having to report back to Adolf Meyer that the golden boy of psychiatry was a fraud. Now she had a completely different entity learning the same details that would be in her own report. So she continued to investigate, but now with a little extra confidence. Her next move was to visit as many of Henry's discharged patients as she could. These patients were reported to be cured. The miracle was that any of them were alive. Phyllis was able to track them down and interview them. I'm sure that it's not going to surprise you to hear that All of Henry's living patients were still insane or mentally ill or unstable in some way. All of them. At this point, Dr. Phyllis had nothing more to prove. So she closed her investigation, compiled her reports, and submitted her findings to Dr. Adolf Meyer, her professor, Cotton's professor, and Cotton's biggest patron. Well... You remember that I said that this is a story about professional arrogance and medical arrogance. That also applies to Dr. Meyer. Even when faced with the reality of Henry Cotton's failure as a psychiatrist and the absolute debacle that was known as the Trenton State Medical Hospital, he just couldn't bring himself to tell anyone that his star pupil was a failure. So, Adolf Meyer suppressed the results from Dr. Phyllis Greenacre's investigation. She did all that work for nothing. For Henry, that meant one less thing that he'd have to worry about. But he still had the Bright Simpson Committee to deal with, and they didn't seem to be going anywhere. As a matter of fact, they started holding hearings in which Cotton's former employees and patients testified to the terrors of Henry's medical practices. And they had a lot to say. Dr. Phyllis might have felt a sense of vindication when the most shocking allegation against Cotton was spilled by one of his former nurses. Her claim was that 87% of Cotton's patients did not recover, as he liked to tell everyone, but instead that 87% of them died under the knife. Now, this nurse, though, she had been fired by Henry, so some could make the claim that she was just lying because she wanted her job back but she made it clear that she never wanted to work at Trenton State ever again. Her only reason for speaking out was that she wanted to prove to the world exactly who Dr. Henry Cotton was. The nurse's name was Edith Strong. 
She told the committee about Dr. Cotton's insistence on removing teeth and that removing them did not seem to improve the health of his patients. She also let it be known that Dr. Cotton took patients into surgery without having a reason to, and that he usually had no clue of what outcome to expect. She flat out said that he was, in her words, experimenting with the knife. Edith Strong's testimony was a watershed moment. After her testimony was heard, the floodgates opened and person after person told their story about what happened while they were under Dr. Cotton's supervision as a patient or an employee. Those whose family members had died after Cotton's surgeries spoke their pieces too. Luckily for Cotton, this hearing wasn't a one-way street. He would get a chance to speak for himself and clear up all of these silly rumors that were being spread about him and his stellar work. And when that time came, you'll never believe what happened. He came down with a case of mental insanity. That's right, the good doctor just up and lost his mind. A 1925 August edition of the Asbury Park Press stated very plainly, Dr. Cotton suffers nervous collapse. Strain of bright inquiry is blamed. He seemed to have mysteriously fallen to Bright's disease. I can't help but wonder if that's the first thing that came to his mind because he was being interviewed by the Bright Committee. I do think that it's a funny coincidence. Bright's disease was a nervous condition that got the better of him at such a convenient time. A nervous condition, right? I bet. Nervous about losing his salary, which, by the way, he was still receiving while under investigation. And it was a decent salary. $8,000 per year. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $145,000 in today's 2024 money. It didn't make him rich, but it made him comfortable. Plus, he earned even more money from speaking engagements and private clients. And put together, all of that did make him rich. So what, do you think that he was going to just lie down and let an investigation take his money away from him? He was just crazy, not stupid. So here's what he did. Dr. Cotton remained mentally unwell until all of the talk about the investigation died down. You know, he just waited around for the press to start talking about something else besides those thousands of people he had maimed and hundreds of people he had killed. Yeah, so when the records of 645 of his surgery patients were examined, and compared to 407 patients who had not received his magical healing surgeries, the outcome was that the recovery rate was higher among those who had not been treated by Dr. Cotton. Surprise, surprise. But when the time was right, Henry came back better than ever. He knew that his cures worked, so he performed them on himself. Henry cured his bride's disease by removing his own teeth. Well, now the people could see for themselves. They knew that he was mentally unwell before. They'd read the papers. But here he stood before them, obviously sane. The only thing different was that he was missing several teeth. So it was proof that his methods clearly worked. With that, Dr. Henry Cotton was back in business, and it couldn't have come at a better time. The cost of running the state asylum had increased during his absence. But when Henry, the tooth-pulling machine, came back, he was saving them $1,000 per day in maintenance costs. He told the Asbury Park Press of three women he cured instantly. There was the woman who was depressed, agitated, and considerably dilapidated, as he said. Henry removed 14 of her teeth, and she was cured within 24 hours. Next up was a girl of 18 years, as he described her, who had already had her upper and lower bicuspids removed and an operation on her colon. No improvement, but, quote, finally, with the extraction of two more lower canines, the patient recovered, end quote. The world wouldn't see the likes of this kind of miraculous healing again until Jonestown. And finally, there was a girl of 20 years, again his description, all infection had been removed from her except for her vital teeth. He had already performed an operation on her colon, too, and she was still insane. 
But after he removed her vital teeth, meaning her healthy teeth, she was good to go. The doctor went on to explain that these treatments worked particularly well with young people like the 18 and 20-year-old girls cited in this recovery report. Does it sound to you like things just went back to usual after the Bright Simpson investigation came to a screeching halt? That's how it sounds to me. Cotton's credibility had been restored after he performed his own tooth extractions. So he doubled down on the home dentistry and pulled his wife's teeth too. Because of that, a lot of people believed that what he was doing worked. Or at the very least, they believed that he believed it worked. Otherwise, why would a man change his own wife's physical appearance for the worse? And you remember those 18 and 20-year-old girls who were a part of his successful comeback. When talking about them, he said that his methods worked particularly well on young people. He knew this to be true because he already had two successful case studies under his belt. I told you that we'd get back to this. Those young case studies were both of his sons. They were not insane and had never been insane. But with Henry's treatments, they never would be. Because Henry removed their teeth. All of their teeth. You see, this was a prophylactic treatment for each of them before starting freshman year at Princeton. I'm sure that those young men felt very confident starting their university studies without teeth. Well, at least they'd be sane. Or would they? We'll get back to them again. Dr. Cotton continued on with his shenanigans at the Trenton State Mental Hospital until 1930, when he was extended the grace to be able to retire instead of getting booted out of there for being a homicidal fraud. But even then, he was still given more honor, respect, and money than he deserved. He was given the title of Medical Doctor Emeritus. He would continue to conduct clinical research at the hospital, and he would maintain his $8,000 per year salary. His clinical research led him to yet another bright idea. Tell me what you think of this one. I know you're going to love it. Colectomies. Partial or complete removal of the colon for children. Not only, according to Dr. Henry, would this procedure prevent insanity, but it will stop your little boys from that yucky habit called masturbation. Ew. I mean, you don't want little Timmy yanking on his wanker, do you? Well, take out his colon and he won't do it anymore. Hmm. <clears throat> Maybe because he'll be dead. But if he's not alive, he's not masturbating either, so technically Dr. Cotton was on to something. Henry's questionable surgical methods were employed and even praised on and off for years after his retirement. In 1932, there was a report of a Dr. Julian Wolfson, a neurology professor at Stanford University, who also claimed to be curing insanity by removing teeth and tonsils. I can guess that stories like these filled Dr. Cotton with joy. He loved knowing that his methods were being used. The following year, in 1933, he was whining about the fact that the doctors at Trenton State were not employing his surgical cures for insanity. And that is so odd to me, but again, speaks to his professional arrogance. Had he forgotten that the Bright investigation ever happened? People testified that he killed patients. Sure, the state dropped the ball, but it was out in the open that he was a homicidal lunatic who happened to have a medical degree. Any other person who had literally gotten away with murder several times over would have shut his mouth, accepted his salary payments, and stayed under the radar. But not Dr. Cotton. In an article from February 1933 called Cotton Asks His Methods to Be Used, three years after his retirement, he was complaining about how the Trenton State Mental Hospital was being run. He wanted to know why the physicians weren't pulling out teeth and tonsils and colons. Because when he was there, he was saving the state thousands of dollars a day. He was getting those patients out of there in three months. But these new guys were taking ten months and longer. You know, if the state wasn't so stupid, they'd be making them do what I taught them to do and saving big bucks. But I guess they want to be stupid. That was his attitude. 
Here's a part of that story. Quote, I respectfully request the board to restore these operative procedures to the importance they deserve. If not, then some of these 475 patients will be condemned to a lifelong residence in the state hospital. End quote. Notice, he's not talking about curing them, just getting them out of the hospital. Henry would go on to criticize the new recovery rates at Trenton State, which had plummeted since he had been running the place. Could the difference have been that the new staff was reporting real numbers and not killing patients and saying that the dead ones were cured? That seemed to be the case. Henry's egotism couldn't get past the fact that his name wasn't in headlines receiving praise anymore. This was what his career had finally come to. It was all about his ego, not even money, because after he retired, his private practice was thriving. He was treating the relatives of extremely wealthy people who thought that Dr. Cotton was the best because he was famous and fashionable. Just for the record, those rich patients didn't fare well under his care either. A few months after being angry about the state of New Jersey not killing its mental patients, Henry Cotton spent a day minding his own business for a change. Like a lot of men of status in that time, Henry was considered to be a club man, a man who was a member of multiple exclusive social organizations. One that he belonged to was the Trenton Club. It was a place where he could dine with colleagues or play golf. It still exists today as a Trenton Country Club. On the Monday afternoon of May 8, Henry met with several of his friends and associates for luncheon. After he ate, he wasn't feeling quite well. So he made his way to a pantry where he kept a bottle of his heart medication. Then, the next time someone saw him, he was lying on the floor with his pill bottle in his hands. Physicians arrived at the scene, but he was already dead. At the age of 57, just 10 days shy of his 58th birthday. At last, his reign of terror was over. Henry would get one more round of professional praise when the obituary pages and life tribute stories were published in the newspapers in the few days following his death. But of course, he wouldn't get to enjoy those. He never deserved to enjoy any of the acclaim that he received throughout his medical career. And I can't help but wonder how much better life would have been for his patients if Henry had not been propped up on a pedestal that he did not deserve. I also can't help but wonder about those politicians who fed Henry's ego with their cheers of approval. I mean, it didn't take a medical professional to know that Dr. Cotton was killing and maiming his patients just to save the state some money. Would the almighty dollar have been less important to them if one of their own family members had found themselves in need of care at Trenton State? Well, two of those New Jersey government officials who so fervently supported Henry Cotton did have to spend their final days at Trenton State Hospital. Joseph Raycroft, who was the president of the Board of Managers at Trenton State Hospital, and Burdett Lewis. He was the commissioner of New Jersey's Department of Institution and Agencies. These two guys helped to promote Dr. Cotton's weirdo surgeries, some of which were still being performed years after Henry's death. So I can only wonder if they had any regrets about their actions, as they were being pushed into that hospital in wheelchairs to spend their last days. I can only hope that their stay at Trenton State was as pleasant as they knew any other patients of Cotton's would have been. And Dr. Phyllis Greenacre, who tried to put an end to Henry's madness by conducting her investigation, she went on to have a magnificent career and became one of the most prominent figures of the New York Psychoanalytic Society and Institute the oldest organization of its kind in the United States, and one that is still held in high regard. She was celebrated for her research and training, and Henry Cotton would have hated that. Dr. Phyllis lived a long, fruitful life and retired at the age of 90. She lived to be 95, passing away in 1989. As for Henry Cotton's sons, Henry Cotton Jr. and Adolph Cotton, Literally, as I said his name, I'm just now wondering if Adolf was named after Henry's professor. 
and patron, Adolf Meyer. Anyway, the two young men graduated from Princeton and went on to have successful careers. Maybe I should say start successful careers. Henry Cotton Jr. became Dr. Henry Cotton Jr., and he went into psychiatry just like his father. He even served on the mental clinic staff at Trenton State Hospital. Adolf became a scientist. He was the assistant curator of arts and archaeology at the British Museum in London. Did their lack of teeth prevent mental illness in the brothers? It doesn't seem that way. They both committed suicide. Adolf Cotton booked a trip home from London in February of 1936. When his ship docked in New York on the 10th, his luggage was found, but there was no trace of him. By Valentine's Day, the reported conclusion was that he jumped overboard before the ship crossed the Atlantic. None of his fellow passengers or ship's crewmen had seen him on the final stretch of the voyage. Dr. Henry Cotton Jr. overdosed on sleeping pills in 1948 at the age of 40. He left behind his wife, four-year-old daughter, and his mother. Thousands of maimed patients, hundreds of dead patients, two dead sons, and a wife left behind with no one. It looks like the high-achieving doctor who was helping New Jersey win big on their books with his impressive resume and recovery rates was nothing more than a fraudulent failure after all. Dr. Henry Cotton failed his colleagues, his staff, his family, and himself because his pride was more important than his integrity. The moral of the story is, don't be like Henry Cotton, because he was one sick bastard. Dorothy Gibson was also someone who suffered from a severe case of professional arrogance. She was an actress who survived the sinking of the Titanic. Her professional arrogance was fueled by her producer. He was her boss. And she was his mistress. And a total hot mess. You can see her story here. I will leave links to it in the description box and the pinned comment. My sources for this story are The Central New Jersey Home News Archives, 1910 Asbury Park Press Archives, 1910, 1913, 1914, 1918, 1920, 1921, 1922, 1924, 1925, 1928, 1929, 1930, 1931, 1933, 1936, and 1961. The Freehold Transcript Archives, 1912, 1925, 1928, 1931, and 1933. The Daily Record Archives, 1913, 1921, 1922, 1925, 1932, and 1946. The Monmouth Inquirer Archives, 1919. Monmouth Democrat Archives, 1920 and 1922. The Coast Star Archives, 1920 and 1929. Messenger Press Archives, 1923 and 1932. Mottawan Journal Archives, 1929. The Cautionary Tale of Psychiatrist Henry Aloyas Cotton by Anne Hudson Jones for The Lancet. The Patterson Evening News Archives, 1929. National Library of Medicine. Calgary Herald Archives, 1936. Desperate Remedies on Princeton.edu. The Philadelphia Inquirer Archives, 1948. The Horrifying Cures of Dr. Henry Cotton, America's Biggest Quack by Laura Martisute. Press of Atlantic City Archives, 1955. Tragic Cases from Turn of the Century Insane Asylums by Deborah Kelly, fact checked by Jamie Freighter. St. Louis Post Dispatch Archives, 2007. And I and many of my non newspaper article sources used as a primary source Madhouse, a tragic tale of megalomania and modern medicine 
by Andrew Skull. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon, Ties Too Hot, Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the hot, hot mess history. The link is in the description box. If you have a business, YouTube channel, or social media platform that you would like to promote to the hot mess history mess stories, email us at taiwan at taisaidwhattaisaid.com. We'll come up with a campaign that gives you visibility and fits your budget.